All right, and three, two, one. Welcome to The Peaceful Truth, the podcast where we talk about everything from women empowerment, feminism, and everything in between. You are joined by your host, Kenzie Meekbeck, and I am joined by one of my childhood friends that I reconnected with a few weekends ago, Jana Vincent. How are you, Jana? I'm doing well. How are you doing today? Good, good. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, um, I wanted to explain to them how, like, the viewers, how we know each other, though, but I guess it's through, kind of through Emily, I guess, one of our best friends, our mutual best friend. Yeah, sorry, there's a little bit of lag. Yeah, no worries. Of <laughs> complex internet. Yeah, I guess through Emily, because I think I met one time, she was like, my neighbors are awesome, come meet my neighbors, and yeah. I would have been five, and you would have been... Four. Three, I guess. Wow. Four? Yeah. <laughs> we Wow. I didn't realize it was that long. Yeah, because Emily and I were in kindergarten together. That's when we hit it off. It had to have been that long, though, that we were also, like, <laughs> childhood friends. That's insane. I can't believe. And now we're, like, almost to 30, which is, like, also something I don't want to think about. <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> Every time Facebook gives me those reminders of, you've been friends for 20 years on Facebook, or, or not 20 years, but, like, 10. Yeah. Like, and I'm just like, oh, how am I this old? Yeah, I but um, yeah, it was a blast. Um, reconnecting, we were reconnecting at a bachelorette uh, party, so that was so fun. Mm -hmm. um, but I wanted to interview you today because you're doing something, something super cool. But first, I want you to kind of discuss what you're studying in school and where you go to school and just tell us a little bit about that background first. Okay, absolutely. So... Right now, I am starting my fourth year in an interdisciplinary biomedical science program, so biomedical engineering, and I am in Purdue, at Purdue, Indiana, Purdue University in Indiana, sorry. Official <laughs> Yeah. Purdue University, Indiana, West Lafayette, beautiful, flat, full of corn, but it's peaceful. I actually enjoy the change of pace from Austin, so I actually did my undergraduate degree, as I just mentioned, University of Texas, Austin. Mm -hmm. um, I have... An interesting background. So I triple majored in biology, studio art, and Italian. Busy. How many hours was like a semester? Did you do like those 18 hour semesters? I did 18 hour and I did 21 hour for two semesters. No, thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I decided after graduating that as much as medical school had appealed to me, I just couldn't shake the creative side of my art degree and after t discussing with advisors, I decided to pursue biomedical engineering, and that's how I ended up at Purdue. That's perfect. Um, so what project are you working on in particular? Can you kind of describe it to us high level? I know you can't go into too, too much depth. Plus, it yeah. might just, it went over my head a little bit. So maybe <laughs> okay. some layman's terms. You're developing new MRI technology, is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Okay, tell us a little bit about it. Okay. So I'll start from the very beginning. So in my opinion, medical imaging is absolutely critical because the earlier you can detect something or the more accurately, the sooner you can treat and the better treatment plan doctors can devise. So with that in mind, I got into magnetic resonance imaging, also known as MRI. And one thing that I personally like about MRI is it doesn't expose you to the same radiation that you would be exposed to in like an x-ray. So in terms of, you know, potential exposure for uh, cancer development, you just don't have that with MRI because it's non-ionizing radiation. So there's a little bit less risk, which is one of the reasons I really like it. And you can get great images from the scans. But right now, with the way coils fit, which whenever you have an MRI, you go into the scanner or the MRI bore. It's like a pretty enclosed tube. It's a little claustrophobic for some. Yeah, and I've never gotten one, but I a lot of people tell me it's terrifying. A lot of people hate it. Well, yeah, just to tell you the size, we scan football players and do concussion studies. We've had to manually shove some of them into the center of the magnet. It's it's a challenge. Those defensive linemen, <laughs> that's about the size maximum of these machines. I'd be like, aren't you used to like tackles where you're in a pile or something like that? Yeah. <laughs> so... Anyway, in order to basically hone in on a particular anatomy that we're interested in imaging, we put something called a radiofrequency coil 
over the anatomy being enriched, whether it's the head or a wrist or a knee, we have a coil made for that joint or that anatomy. And these are great. So you can almost think of these as just ways or like a lens that kind of focuses on that one region because we want to adjust the spins in the brain. I'm not going to go into too much detail with that, but we're essentially looking at the hydrogen atoms in the brain and we measure how long it takes for those little hydrogen atoms. You can imagine it like an earth spinning in an orbit. When you apply a magnetic pulse, you tip them off their orbit and what happens is once that pulse is over, they relax. And so what these coils act as are receivers that kind of measure that time it takes for all those hydrogen atoms to realign back to their normal state. So that energy that's transmitted and received from the coils goes back to the computer and creates the image that we know. Because if you think about it, everything in your body is made of water. So you have different levels of hydrogen in different areas of your body. So that's kind of how we create an image contrast in probably the most basic form of MRI. There's a little bit of more quantum physics that goes into it, but <laughs> in a basic Yeah, I sense. know. You were explaining it to me, and I was like, uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's probably the easiest way to think about it, is you're yeah. applying an energy pulse, tipping it off the, ax the axis, and, you know, Newton's law, every action, there's an equal opposite. So once it relaxed, energy is re-released, we measure that, goes through the computer, we get magical images from it. <laughs> What's but, the benefit of this um, technology um, and developing this type of technology? So with MRI, one of the advantages with MRI as compared to say x-ray is we get what we can we call image slices. So say for example, you are looking at a wrist for one. When we image, we can actually image in slices so it's almost like you can view the plane of just your fingers and you can progress through the actual bone and tissue all the way through. So say you had a tumor somewhere buried inside one of you know your metacarpals, you could actually go through and find exactly at what depth and what slice that, that the tumor was in or something like that or the injury. So MRI is excellent for soft tissue injuries and you can find bone damage, like uh, erosion from autoimmune diseases, such as arthritis. Um, but obviously, most people are probably familiar with x-ray, which takes one static image of the arm. And those are great for identifying fractures or something, you know, a major break that's easily identifiable. But for something, one of the common applications really is when looking at brain injury, seeing if there's regions of the brain where there might be uh, bleak and fluid. So, you know, if you get hit really hard, there are white matter tracks or tracks in the brain through which fluid flows through. If you get hit really hard, you can damage those tracks. So this is kind of a way you can slice through the brain and see, okay, in this region of the brain, we have fluid leakage, which may not be as obvious in other imaging modalities like x-ray or something like that. Wow. Um, that's amazing. Um, so in particular though, with the type that, of like, what makes it, um, does, is the imaging any different with the new type of MRI technology that you're developing? Cause it's closer to your body almost, mm -hmm. right? Am I correct in that? Is there yes. any benefits with that type of technology versus others? Are you allowed to talk about that information? Yeah, so I can go through that. So I guess what I digressed on a little bit is I'm working on novel radio frequency coils. So standard coils, mostly that you'll see are what they call a bird cage because it's literally a cage that fits over your head or fits over your arm. There are some that you can wrap almost like a blanket. You can kind of wrap it around, but most hospitals are going to have bird cage coils. Issue with those is one size does not fit all. You have pediatric, and then you have small, medium, large adults. And with these coils, you want to have the highest resolution possible. Because again, you're trying to diagnose, not really diagnose, but image so that you can get a better treatment. So you can think of like your body almost like a cell phone tower. It emits a signal. And these coils are like your cell phone. And you know from just having a phone, the closer you are to a tower, the better your signal and the clearer the phone call. The same works with these radio frequency coils. The closer they are to your body, 
as the signal source, the better the image quality is going to be. So I'm developing a stretchable coil that just like a compression sleeve, you pull on your arm or your leg, you can slide this coil on so it custom fits to your body and allows for the closest placement to the skin. And for those that may not be able to position their arm fully outstretched or you know awkwardly kind of hang it behind because you're crunched in a machine, you can image at a bend. Traditional coils don't allow you to image while your arm is bent. So not only do you have an increase in image quality, patient comfort, you also have more dynamic imaging options because you can look at tendon interactions with the bone or cartilage interactions while somebody actually were to move. That their is amazing. <laughs> uh, that's really cool. Um, how does like this idea, how did it originate or how did you think of this and what kind of brought this to mind? So one thing I've always been interested in is the concept of wearable electronics and even down to uh, uh, options like, you know, the touchscreen gloves, having that slight bit of conductive fiber that allows you to use your smartphone with gloves on, which, of course, in Indiana, you, you want that. <laughs> so having that exposure to the idea of wearable electronics and customized medicine just really kind of ingrained that path of I want to integrate a wearable nature into these more bulky or sometimes uncomfortable types of imaging because in my opinion, something that's deemed more wearable is going to be more patient friendly and even user friendly because you're not trying to sit there and position something extremely large on somebody. You can just be like, hey, can you pull this on like a sock? And it's a lot easier. When we were talking about this, um, someone brought up um, whether there's any more dangers that you've seen thus far. I know there's probably additional testing that will go on because it's mm -hmm. such a new thing that you're introducing. Um, but is there any danger, like any radiation? And I don't know if that's a silly question or anything like that. No, with MRI, there's really no risk um, as far as radiation goes because it's what we call in like the MR world non-ionizing. So it's not like x-rays. Those are the ones that when you get exposed to a lot can be dangerous. So in this case, since all we're applying are those magnetic pulses, there's nothing as dangerous as far as that goes. However, in some MRI scans, you can use a contrast dye, which have had some toxicity links. But for my research and what I'm doing, I, I don't use any contrast. So I was going to say the only other danger, and you can Google this if you want something scary, but also interesting to look at, it's these are giant magnets. They have such a high field strength. I, I forget the fraction off the top of my head and I should know it, but uh, we use what we call three Tesla magnet. Tesla is the strength of this magnet. The Earth's magnetic field is on the level of micro Teslas. So this is, that's what, like 10 to the negative six? <laughs> so we're using <laughs> a very, very, very powerful magnet. And so you, if you have any metal implants, earrings, you know, uh, most dental works okay because it's uh, like surgical steel, which isn't magnetic, but mm. you can't go in with any sort of metal or it will rip it off of you. So Google MRI mishaps if you want something interesting because there are people that have walked in with like fire extinguishers that get sucked into the magnet and you can't stop them. Oh, yeah. No. That's so that so is the danger. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, what a terrifying way. Um, but does that have any impact on like the type of things you're developing? Would there be any health risk there? As long as people follow the standard protocol, is there any other health risks you can think of? Um, off the top of my head, no, because I've done safety tests on making sure nothing sparks, you know, all the electrical connections, everything works properly. Um, I've done heating tests. So I've push these coils to their maximum running hour, two hour tests on them. They don't overheat because one of the risks of custom built coils would be patient burns. Something overheats, it can burn being that close to the skin. Um, I think that's the main one, but so far in all my tests, I think the most I've had in terms of heating is somewhere between two and three degrees. Mm -hmm. So, and it sits around 70, 72. So. Nothing that should be uncomfortable. Well, I'm so impressed. I feel like 
you're changing the world with this project. Um, and it's just awesome to know you because I think that's really cool. Um, so what is the overall goal of this? I guess we mentioned the benefits, so this question might be repetitive, but what was the goal um, to develop this thing in particular versus like this standard MRI, MRI? Is it strictly because a lot of people are resistant to MRIs and a little intimidated by them or in this standard of how um, the machine works now? Or what was the main goal that comes out of this or the main thing that like is the selling point, I guess? For me, it is better image quality mm -hmm. because right now hospitals generally have a lower powered magnet. So I mentioned three Tesla. That's usually research grade. Hospitals only have one and a half Tesla machines. And it's usually upwards of a million to two million dollars to get a more powerful machine. So hospitals can't justify the cost. Yeah. But if I can present them with a highly affordable coil that has better image quality, there is potential to have three Tesla image quality on a one and a half Tesla machine. And right now, radio frequency coils are very expensive and I'm making these for less than a hundred dollars. Cool. So that's amazing. Do you feel like though, so would they, you mentioned a machine that's still being there. I'm, I'm just not very familiar with MRI technology, so I apologize, but this might be questions that most people have. Um, mm -hmm. But you mentioned that there's still a machine. If you, Even if you wear this wearable technology, would you still have to go into like that cylinder thing at all? Um, what, what happens there? Yes, so you do actually still need to go into the machine because there are very large uh, gradient magnets inside that bore. So that actually all of your magnets line the inside of that machine. That is where the magnetic field is generated. So unfortunately you still need that tube that is very small. <laughs> you still need that um, because the frequent radio frequency coil is just a means to help transmit and receive. So not quite the magnet itself. Do you, would it change the way at all that you have to like lay there still or would it change any of the process as far as like different things approaching on you more closely? Would it change any of that process? Um, in, in some sense it would. So in this scenario with these tighter fitting coils, you may not have to position as uncomfortably in the machine. So if you're putting like a cage on a shoulder and you were broader through the shoulders, you might have to kind of crunch your arm up so that you fit inside the machine. Whereas having something tighter fitting, you might be able to relax a little bit more and hold your shoulder back. And same thing goes with a hip, because oftentimes the hip gets really close to the edge of that magnet cylinder, essentially. So it would allow you a little bit more freedom of motion as far as positioning. But unfortunately, with MRI, we still need to stay very still. It's kind of one of the critical things is you move as little as possible, but hopefully if you're positioned more comfortably, you won't feel the urge to move. I'm sure just the little bit of relief is amazing. And just yeah. the fact that that intense image quality, I'm sure you're going to, that can save many people's lives. Um, so I kind of want to transition unless, is there anything else about your project that you wanted to talk about today that I haven't asked? Um, I, I think that covers it, but I mean, just the goal of it, like I said, one was to reduce costs because if you can reduce the cost to hospitals, you're reducing the cost to people. And right. I know that's a huge deterrent with getting a lot of medical imaging is mm -hmm. it's going to cost a lot. So if you can help make these imaging modalities accessible, that helps in preventative care. Because right. then you're not waiting till something progresses where it's needed. You could actually go in and you know, say, I, I think I might have a concussion. Can you look at it? And it won't cost the subject or the patient as much money. And that's that's one of the goals in biomedical engineering is to not only make it better, but to improve the lives not only through medical intervention, but also through reduction of costs for individuals. And that's I like exactly what you're developing. Um, I'm in like a field of medical education and I feel like what you're developing is right in line with the trend of being very patient driven care. Mm -hmm. I think it's right in that trend of what you're talking about um, is right in where everything seems to be headed, even like with laws and everything like that. So that's really cool. 
what drew you to biomedical engineering? What made you stick through it? And what made you want to be a woman in STEM? For me, you know, I always had waffled between medical school and biomedical engineering. I originally was more drawn towards medical school. I, you know, I wanted to be that doctor. I wanted to treat patients. I wanted to make an impact in people's lives. And then the further I progressed through schooling, I just, like I mentioned earlier, I couldn't shake that creative side. And I know doctors can be creative, but I really wanted an avenue that allowed me to utilize my creativity in a means to create a device that could not only help people, but to also aid doctors. Because if you're aiding doctors and their ability to do something, you're reaching even a wider audience. So that's what drew me specifically to biomedical engineering because of the (laughs) (laughs) The interdisciplinary. It's like literally life or death, you know? Exactly. So just being able to, because I, I probably could tell by the fact that I had three undergraduate degrees, I really have a broad range of interests. (laughs) And so biomedical, yeah, biomedical allowed me to do that. I work with programming. I do mechanical engineering. I do electrical engineering. I use biology. It's just a great culmination of my interests. So that's what drew me particularly to my field. And then STEM, I don't know. I've always liked math and science and technology. I mean, I think I've been on a computer since I was five, pretty much when they came out. So Yeah. And look at you. Like the first thing you do is knocking it out of the park on creativity of something that hasn't done or been thought of. (laughs) Um, So what advice would you give to a woman? Let's say a woman's listening in her early 20s or maybe 18, just trying to decide where to go from here. What advice would you give to a woman interested in this field, your field specifically, and then maybe broaden the question and STEM in general? Okay. Well, given that once I graduated, I did take about a year and a half off because I wasn't entirely sure what I wanted to do. So while I worked, I took supplemental classes in computer programming and advanced mathematics and some engineering as well, just to make sure it's what I wanted to do. But Mm -hmm. what I have to say, I think the advice would be, it's never too late to pursue engineering. And even if you don't have a degree in engineering, you can take your biology degree or your chemistry degree and just take a few programming classes when you have free time, you know, uh, catch up on some of the advanced math. And I mean, you can start your program from that. You don't actually have to be an engineer from undergraduate to pursue engineering at a graduate level. But if, you know, you, you're not sure on which engineering is right for you, uh, there's a lot of great programs like at here at Purdue, we do freshman engineering. So you kind of do general engineering classes and then you choose what your field is. So oh, cool. find a program that is a little bit more multidisciplinary and go from there. And don't let anyone tell you what engineering you're better suited for. That's amazing. Is there anything overall on this topic that we uh, today that you wanted to talk about? Anything I haven't asked that you wanted to mention? Hmm. I don't know. I don't know. That's a tough one. Yeah, I always um, like to wrap with that yeah. just in case I forgot something that's just maybe out of my realm of questions. I mean, I think I've covered most everything. I guess one thing that I would say also for advice, because this is one thing that gets on my nerves ever so slightly every time, is if you want to pursue higher education. Do not let the term professional student get you down. Because <laughs> <laughs> I've had some people tell me, oh, well, you're a PhD student. You're a professional student, right? It's like, no. <laughs> so really, just ignore work. those people. That would be my other bit of advice. Ignore those that don't understand. Yeah. And they don't understand when you work, like, you know, 70 hours a week in the lab, but you're still, you know, thrilled at what you're doing. Exactly. Right? Heck, probably a lot more than a lot of nine to fivers anyway. So, yeah. so find your passion in life. Don't let anyone discourage you. And I mean, really you can do anything you set your mind to. That's amazing. So, um, I don't know if you've ever listened before, but I always wrap up an episode with what you're just looking forward to this week. It could be anything in your life. It doesn't have to be professional. <laughs> I always like to wrap on like a positive note. Like what are you looking forward to most? Oh goodness. Well, 
my research went really well so far this week, so I am looking forward to taking the next steps with that. That is great progress. Um, and there's so much I'm looking forward to, and in the future, Emily's wedding, where I get to see you again. <laughs> oh, that's going to be so much fun. That's like the main thing I'm looking forward to, too. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I guess, you know, being a grad student, definitely the thing I'm looking forward to most in the immediate time frame is just the progress I make on my research and then taking those next steps. So, perfect. Well, I really appreciate you coming on today, Dana. Yeah, thank you for having me. It was good catching up again. <laughs> I know, it was so much fun. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem.